Hello, welcome everyone. We have the lights off so you can see the screen, but there's some things over here on the side that will be spoken about later, so we may have to get the lights back on. Anyway, thank you everyone for coming. My name is John Bowen, I'm Julie's, one of Julie's brothers. Bill, my brother Bill is over there. Uh, okay. And I would like to thank everyone for coming to the celebration of life with Julie. I'd like to start today with uh, sort of an outline of some of the influences that I perceive that many of us will talk about today and just kind of encapsulate what she influenced people, how she influenced us, and vice versa. Um, she was born in 1943. She was the first child for a, a young couple, where they were 23 years of old, age. Uh, they had experienced the Depression. They were having uh, World War II, and uh, she was there first. And of course, you know, the, the first child gets a little bit more attention. <laughs> But uh, reading some excerpts from Julie's baby book, The Love and Happiness was very apparent as our father was an only child. Julie was the first grandchild for his, his mom. And uh, Grandma lived down in Santa Cruz. She loved that we would come visit her, and we did quite often. Um, Grandma lived in... Grandma lived in... She wrote this uh, note, I found this in the baby book, and uh, talking about spoiling children, she <laughs> says, please tell me when you are ready for shoes, I want to buy the first pair, and the second pair, and the third pair, <laughs> and after that, probably some more. And then I also noted at the end, uh, the war makes lots of things hard to get, so I hope mommy can find the right kind of shoe. As our father wanted to spend time with his family, uh, he decided to take a job as a teacher so he'd have the summers off. And invariably, those summers meant a couple of weeks camping in Yosemite. So here we are on our way and uh, at the top of the Glacier Point Hotel, which is no longer there. Um, He had said, in fact, that, yeah, he wanted to be a teacher so that he could take that time off. And every year we'd go, I think from, I remember 1953 was the first year. You guys didn't go, they just took me, right? Um, and I was three years old, so I guess, I don't know. So in that photo, there's the boy and the other boy. And that's Julie, right? That's Julie. My mom is, must be taking the picture. And who are, where, which, which two are you? Which two are you? I'm better looking like <laughs> He's the good looking one. So in the, the Glacier Point Hotel, it's Julie, Bill, me, and my dad. And then in the car, Bill's poking out of the window, and I'm with my mom, and it's Julie. And then a bunch of later here, Julie and mom uh, at a campsite. Camp 14 was our favorite. We'd often go with our cousin's family from Berkeley, and our cousins are here. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Susie. And we spent a lot of time in Yosemite. And uh, in, we had so many memories from that time, especially the, the, uh, uh, the nightly uh, campfire programs and the uh, spectacular firefall, which they had every night. And we just never thought that would go away. It was just incredible, but you know, you're there all the time, it's there, so of course it, it'll always be there, but it was remarkable to watch. So I would like to definitely say that all of our time in the Santa Cruz area and Yosemite definitely played a part in developing Julie's appreciation for nature. And as you can read in the uh, obituary that Bill wrote, it really helped Julie to form her love and appreciation for for nature. 
Now I'm going to talk about Julie's art talent. <laughs> there. Julie started drawing early on. Uh, she continued to develop this through her teen and college years. We have a couple of her sketches over there on display, and my brother Bill will uh, talk more about Julie's art life, along with the uh, special panels that we have. I have to turn the light on, I think, for that. She also took uh, an early interest in European history and culture in seventh grade. This article was published uh, of a project she created just by looking at a picture of a medieval castle in the book. And uh, I liked it, especially at the end, because it says her younger brother, John, age five, has first claim on the model <laughs> now that the demonstrations have been completed because Julie explains his set of building blocks went into the construction. <laughs> so, so that's how that worked. Um, her interest in Europe uh, was uh, culminated when she got to go with my grandmother on a tour of Europe. And she convinced at the end of the tour, she was uh, my grandmother's companion for the tour, but at the end of the tour she said, I want to stay on in Paris, that's okay. And I don't know how she convinced them, but she stayed on in Paris and uh, got to study at the Sorbonne as an artist. So I can't think of a better spot for her. And when she got back, uh, this was, article was published in the Times Herald, and uh, I outlined one of the paragraphs that I thought was kind of, uh, shall I say, uh, amusing. It's, they wanted to know why Paris was so much more exciting than Vallejo. <laughs> um, so how high school? She's just out of high school. She went right after graduation, right? Yeah. Now I'd like to talk about the music uh, in our home. As a musician, perhaps my strongest associations with my sister are built around audio experiences. Certainly, I, I remember Julie started violin lessons early on. I don't know if anybody knows that. She played violin for a couple of years. Uh, and it wasn't, I don't remember it being screechy, so she must have been pretty good right away. Um, <clears throat> but perhaps my life as a musician provided for an artistic connection with Julie as, as adults. Growing up, my parents, it's uh, Ben and Lucy, and Julian the Little. Uh, they loved classical music. We played it all the time. We had Die Fledermaus by Strauss, the Firebird Suite by Stravinsky. We had lots and lots of classical background. And I ended up, as a percussionist, actually going and playing in the Vallejo Junior and Senior Symphonies for a number of years. Uh, but they also liked movie soundtracks. Uh, the Third Man was very popular, West Side Story, Zorba the Greek, and so on. Uh, we would also hear these radio programs. We had two in, in particular we liked. Uh, one was uh, Robin Hood, and the other one was uh, Treasure Island. I know Basil Rathborn narrated the, the Robin Hood one. So we, we would listen and hear these things over and over again, and, and it becomes part of our family culture, and even so much that if I call my brother, the ringtone is some of the music from the uh, Robin Hood. You don't have to play it. In addition, there was this record called At the Drop of a Hat, which is by an English comedy duo known as Flanders and Swamp. An example of British dinner theater, the English comedy songs were uh, ingrained in us for many repeated listenings. Uh, clever wordplay was the high point, which we all came to love, and it formed the basis of our family humor. I would say that all of the records provided us with a shared language throughout our life, and as adults, we'd often quote bits of them quite a bit <laughs> here and there, even towards uh, Julie's last couple of months. So I thought I'd play a portion of one of Flanders Swan's best-known songs, 
which is called the the GNU song. Now we know it's normally it's a silent G, so it should be the new song, but this is the GNU song. Just a part of it. A year ago, last Thursday, I was strolling in the zoo when I met a man who thought he knew the lot. He was laying down the law about the habits of baboons of the number of quills a porcupine has got. So I asked him, what's that creature there? He answered, oh, it's a helk. I might have gone on thinking that was true. If the animal in question hadn't put that chap to shame and remarked, I ain't a help. I'm a gunu. I'm a gunu. I'm a gunu. The nicest work of good nature in the zoo. I'm a gunu. How do you do? You really ought to know wahoo's wahoo. I'm a gunu. Spelt G N U. I'm gun not a camel or a kangaroo. So let me introduce, I'm neither man or moose, so gano, 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 I'm a gano. <laughs> so, moving to Julie's teen years, or high school years, with the addition of a new stereo system in the house, Julie inherited the smaller recording, uh, smaller uh, record player uh, that we had, and she put it in her, in her room, so where she could listen to music in private. She was a big Joan Baez fan, which appealed to her budding interest in social justice. And I also remember hearing the music from the movie Black Orpheus, old records of early blues singers, the rousing spirituals of Mahalia Jackson, and most of all, the stride piano and singing of Fats Waller and the 1930s style jazz. That raucous and joyous sound of Fats really brought a delight to Julie, and most any song from Fats Waller would make her smile and do the trick, especially the song, The Joint Is Jumpin'. His music instantly makes me think of her big, beautiful smile and laughter erupting out as the song played. That was my sister. They have a new expression along old Harlem Way that tells you when a party is ten times more than gay. To say that things are jumping leaves not a single doubt. That everything is in full swing when you hear someone shout. Yes, yes, the charge is jumping. It's really jumping. Come and catch and check your hats. I mean, the charge is jumping. Her love of jazz from the 30s may have also been a factor when she met a young trombonist, Jim Mills, while still in high school. I think he was her first serious boyfriend, perhaps. Uh, but circumstances caused them to go their own separate ways, with each getting married and having their separate lives. However, when Julie found herself single again after 24 years of marriage, finding out that Jim had also gotten divorced, I and others encouraged her to contact Jim which she did, using the pretext she was going to have an art exhibit of her drawings and knowing that he still had some of them. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, this led to a reigniting of their relationship and their love, and for the next 20 years, they were inseparable. Together, they made annual pilgrimages to the New Orleans and Monterey Jazz Festivals, and we were so happy to see them both have that second chance of a loving relationship. Uh, yeah. So Julie's uh, activist and civic involvement, growing up we were raised with a strong political awareness and both of our parents were staunch liberals. In our adult years we'd often discuss the events of the day and what were the actions that were going on and what was needed to see justice and truth prevail. Julie was a big supporter of civil rights and community involvement and she contributed to many causes. She enjoyed being a part of the Vallejo Sister City Association which reflected her interest in 
facilitating unity and brotherhood. And uh, we will be hearing more on this from Brenda Brumfield. Not yet. <coughs> You'll... Um, Julie had a concern for those less fortunate. She was a person who was completely selfless, rather preferring to focus on you and asking questions to find out how your life was. Mm -hmm. And I suspect uh, she always had a thought as to what she might do or say to make things better. Julie is a librarian. I know most of you or many of you are here because of this. Not having any children of her own, Julie loved greeting and meeting them. She was the ultimate Vallejo librarian. She loved sharing books and the interaction with many children who came to the library. And she was quite the delightful host there, entertaining and a bit quirky. We will hear stories from Jenny Grant, Kathleen Birch, Alethea Morton, and as well as Jeff Kingman, who interviewed Julie when she retired. Monterey Jazz Festival. After Jim died in 2006, 2006 or 2008? Yeah, I forget, sorry. Uh, Julie asked me if I wanted to attend the Monterey Jazz Festival in his place. She had this great box seat location that was very close to the stage every year, uh, and she, they went for, I don't know, 20 years? Went for a long time, and, and then, so I started going with her, and I went with her probably about eight times. And then my brother Bill started going, and then we eventually, all three of us started to show up, and uh, we'd start to plan additional outings around that time frame. And uh, one time Bill guided us through Santa Cruz to visit locations of a previously unknown uh, Bowen residence from the past, after Bill had done some studying uh, genealogy research. And we were surprised to find out we had roots in the area prior to our grandmother living there. After the festival was canceled in 2020 because of COVID, we still wanted to plan our now annual get-togethers. And I thought about getting us back to Yosemite at some point. We made one more trip to the Jazz Festival in 2021, but we left open what we'd do for the following year. And up until this time, Chile was managing to get around uh, using a cane, but we could tell it was becoming more difficult for her. I looked into getting Yosemite reservations and was amazingly able to secure a few nights in the valley. It seemed everything fell into place for that Yosemite trip, and in my heart I was one, wondering if it was for a reason. Um, less than three months later, uh, just before New Year's Eve, Julie woke up with too much pain to get out of bed and called her neighbor, Barbara, who then called 911 and got Julie out to the Kaiser emergency. After many tests, her diagnosis indicated that she would need to move into board and care. A perfect spot was found where Julie remained until she passed. Sadly, Julie was never back to see her home in Sandy Beach where she lived for almost 60 years. We will be hearing from Dan Glaze about Julie and the Sandy Beach community. Julie had a, a strong relationship with the Filipino community and the caretakers that we encountered. And they became um, a very important part of Julie's life. I want to give a special thanks now to Anna V doing so much for Julie and uh, all that you did. And Suzette for keeping her, her uh, supported in her last <coughs> year and a half. Thank you so much. And uh, there's also some delicious food that you brought out there, yes. Okay. Thank you. For Julie's 80th birthday in December 2023, we were able to bring Julie out for the art walk here. It was really wonderful to see her chatting it up with numerous old acquaintances, many who had been unaware of Julie's situation. With visits to the hospital increasing, she knew her time was limited, but continued to enjoy active discussions and never complained. Thankfully, she stayed alert and sharp up until the end. 
As some of you may know, phone calls with Julie usually required a, a commitment of several hours. <laughs> <laughs> but I was lucky to have a very long video call with her a few days before she passed. Um, it's hard to believe my sister is uh, no longer with us physically, but I suspect she's observing us all today with great enjoyment. And I do miss her in so many ways. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite our other speakers up, um, the details of their time with Julie. And we'll start with Dan Glaze again. Five years, and we knew her for 15 years after that, so 50 years. Uh, I'm here to talk about Julie of Sandy Beach. I'm sorry, my bad balance of that. You all surely know that uh, Sandy Beach is a small bayside community, 40 homes, uh, built on pilings just north of the Maritime Academy. Julie moved there, as uh, John said, in 1964, so she was there for 60 years. How many of you lived in the same house for 60 years? <laughs> Bob? McConnell? Maybe? Close? Uh, so with 40 homes, say two, two people per house, about 80 people lived there. And Julie uh, knew all of her neighbors every year. How many of you can say you own 80 neighbors? <laughs> and we can. Uh, Sandy Beach was a special place, and Julie was a very special person. I was talking to Brendan Riley the other day. Uh, he grew up in, in Vallejo with Julie, went to junior college with her, and made, remained good friends uh, for many years after that, uh, up until now. Brendan and I pretty much agreed that uh, anybody who lived there had a hard time never believing on this. Uh, they were living on this magnificent stretch of the San Francisco Bay with the beautiful sunsets and the views of Mount Tamalpais every night uh, with seagulls, pelicans, ducks, every waterfall flying around all the time with uh, ever-changing crashing of waves uh, all the time with noises and then you'd have these peaceful still waters occasionally and uh, it was just a gorgeous place to live. And sometimes you'd have uh, your neighbors blowing in a fish off their deck. Uh, it was a very special place. As the saying goes, uh, every day we kind of had to pinch ourselves. And if that was true for Julie, she had to pinch herself 22,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> That's 60 times 365. And even more than that, it was a, it was a special place where, you know, like your song goes, uh, everybody knows your name. And that, that's true. And thinking of what I had to say about Julia Day, I thought of the word quirky. And uh, I was afraid that, you know, it seems like it comes a connotation of odd or something less than complimentary. But uh, one day I bounced the idea up my, my wife Rose, and with a school teacher, she got out her, her trusty iPad, looked it up, looked up quirky, read this definition. Unusual, especially in an interesting or appealing way, with examples a quirky sense of humor, quirky ideas, behavior, a quirky and creative artist. Uh, that was Julie. So let's say Julie was quirky, and that is somewhat, in a, somewhat unusual in an appealing and interesting way. As an example of being a little unusual in an interesting and, in, and an appealing way, let's talk about her affection for cats. <laughs> Julie loved her cats, her neighbor's cats. Any stray cat that ventured anywhere near her house, 
Julie never met a cat she didn't like. <laughs> Loving cats is certainly fine. Doesn't create any problems, except when it does. The problem was that Julie didn't just love cats. She fed cats. And she fed them all the time. She had cat food bowls everywhere around her house, on her front deck, on her back deck. And not surprisingly, she had cats everywhere. <laughs> all the time. And feeding cats by itself isn't a problem. Uh, but as you might realize, uh, other animals like cat food too. Especially skunks. Oh, no. So skunks were fairly common in her stretch of the boardwalk for quite some time. And to, to keep this story short, uh, her neighbors, Rod Boshi, I, I know Rod, along with Greg Gasway and Skip Dodge, mm -hmm. they mastered the art of catching skunks and they have a hard trap. And, they, and the trick was to cover the trap with a blanket so that the skunk couldn't see where the directed spray. So they could, uh, they could move it. And uh, after catching in this very humane manner, which Julie would, would certainly approve of, I think, uh, they would move them across the Cartier's Bridge to a place where they never would come back. <laughs> <laughs> Later, after each skunk uh, catch, they would uh, talk to Julie and implore her, implore her to quit feeding the skunks. And she would, of course, listen politely, maybe nod her head a bit, offer her one hee hee. <laughs> but would never stop putting out cats. So Rod with Gregory and Skip kept catching skunks and finally went home. And they went up to about 20 and then we, we moved so we don't know how, how much higher they went. I want to pause here for just a second to admonish you all that whatever you hear in the library today about Sandy Beach stays in the library. <laughs> and I will deny ever said it anyway. Uh, Julie and I would both assure you that rumors of homeowners declaring the entire area as a building permit-free zone were greatly exaggerated. <laughs> and any stories about the community parking lot doubling its size sometime in the 1980s were gross hyperbole. <laughs> and if you ever thought you saw Julie driving across town in a rented dump truck, it, it was an illusion. <laughs> Another story that I think captures the Julie of Sandy Beach experience was the big hillside collapse that occurred near her house in 1998. And there are some pictures of that up here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll talk a little bit about it. As many of you likely know, uh, rock and mudslides were a fairly common occurrence in Sandy Beach in the wintertime. But this was a big one. Uh, a few of us estimated the volume of dirt and rocks in the slide at 1,000 cubic yards. And then you dirt went all the way up to the uh, to the power lines. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it could have been more because it went for a while. But the story's not so much about the slide, but how the community responded. I sent Julie's brother John some pictures of the slide and what you're seeing, along with a poem written by our neighbor Ben Bullock entitled Ode to a Two-Hour Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Shortly after the slide after the slide, a neighbor, uh, one of our neighbors named Phil Joy, who among other things was a house mover. Said he had a 50 foot long, 4 foot wide structural, what they call glue lamp, that he was going to string on the water from uh, Julie's deck over to Hope Johnson's across the uh, vacant lot as a temporary pedestrian bridge. And, and uh, that, sure enough, he would go get his boats and be back in, in an hour or two. And to keep the story short, suffice to say, Phil and his crew did it. Hence the uh, two hour bridge. And those of us from Hopes down to uh, night number 43 had to use that bridge every day for about several weeks as we commuted, uh, cleared the uh, dirt and rocks from the boardwalk. The Julie angle to this is uh, we would have to walk across her deck uh, sometimes twice a day and sometimes more. But to be kind, and yeah, let's be kind, say with a little clutter. <laughs> had flower pots, <laughs> planters, driftwood, anything else she considered collectible. And almost without fail, when we weaved across her deck, she would be there to cheerfully warn us in her quirky librarian voice, be careful, you know, you know by her quirky, hee hee hee, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> My final story is about Julie, uh, Julie Beach, uh, Sandy Beach, the Julie of Sandy Beach is uh, Julie the artist. The community had experimented with logos uh, a number of times over the years, and when we got there, they had some nice t-shirts with a logo. I'm not sure what she got in her head, but uh, she decided we needed a new one. And uh, suffice to say, the 
community fell in love with this thing. And uh, we have a t-shirt sweatshirt. I've got the t-shirt and sweatshirt here. Uh, and every, every year we would take orders. We have t-shirts, uh, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, beer steins, wine glasses, flags, even had stationery back there. As much as you know, this was just a token example of her talent that she came to the years years not fair. There's some pictures over there. Wrapping up, paraphrasing the ending to all these, uh, all the episodes of the Naked City back in the day, there are a million stories about Julie and Sandy Beach. This has just been a few of them. Julie, Sandy Beach was and is a special place, and Julie of Sandy Beach was a special person that we will all remember fondly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Don Osborne. Anna was born uh, as a longtime friend with Julie and has a couple of. Okay, I'm going to read from Skip, Skip and Gregory. Skip and Gregory are a couple who lived out at the all the two times. Unfortunately, I'm not a longtime friend of Julie. We just moved here about 11 years ago. So we know I'm learning things today, and that's great. That's wonderful. But uh, Skip and Gregory were neighbors of Julie's. Uh, at Sandy Beach, and because they moved away a few years ago, they sent a note and asked me if I would read it. Uh, she says, uh, or they say, we first met Julie on our move-in day to Sandy Beach in January of 2000. It was mid-afternoon and we could see someone shuffling towards us, bent over and holding onto a grocery cart filled with old newspapers and clutching onto a homemade coffee. She looked right at us and with a twinkle in her eye, pixelated eyes and sputtered, you, you boys are moving into number 32, right? We said yes, and her reply was, you're going to love it here, just like Fire Island. <laughs> and she went on her way. <laughs> we found out later Julie didn't get up until mid-afternoon and was usually out and about until midnight or later, definitely a night owl. Julie was known as the crazy cat lady along with raccoons, opossums, skunks, and anything else that happened along the way. She actually had a raccoon crossing sign posted in front of her door <laughs> on the sidewalk. Before she took off on her early morning walk, which was around 3.30 in the afternoon, <laughs> or 4 p.m., she would open a large bag of kibble, spread it on her porch area, and leave it there for any and all animals. Everyone in the neighborhood knew you had to tread softly after dark, for fearing, fear of coming face to face with one of these critters. We always had canned tomato juice at the ready. Just <laughs> she also kept an eye out for any feral cats that looked like they needed some medical attention. And she would trap them, take them to the vet for whatever they needed, and pay for it herself out of her pocket. She would bring the animals home and then release them back to where she had trapped them. She was an animal activist long before the others. Mm -hmm. Although she loved any and all animals, her heart revolved around the McCune Room at Vallejo's John F. Kennedy Library, where we are. Mm -hmm. Having retired from being the head librarian of the JFK Library forever, Julie worked alongside Judy, Judy Hilberg for years and helped make the McCune collection of rare and unique books a world-class collection. She was often there late in the night working on this collection. The other thing that stands out in my mind was her friendship with most of the Bay Area jazz greats. I believe she had been introduced to them through her longtime companion. She seemed to know them all. I also remember her kitchen cupboards, which are over there, or some of them. Um, I remember the kitchen cupboards. They have decoupage, yes, decoupage all over the front with any and all rock and roll bands of the time. Bill Haley, the Comets, the Platters, the Crickets, Ray Charles, Buddy Holly, you name it, and they were on her cupboards where they had been for years and years. I would guess they're still there. <laughs> Julie was truly one of a kind and never a bad word to say about anyone. A collector of rare books, a friend of all, all animals, and a valued member of our neighborhood and the city of Vallejo. She will be missed. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Uh, next, we're going to talk 
but we're going to have people come and talk about her experiences with, with the library world. And we're going to start with Jenny, Jen, and uh, then we'll have Kathleen Birch and uh, also Alethea in succession. So, Jenny, we'll start with you. Well, Julie was such a delightful person. She was, she was quirky, but she was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I, I put together my thoughts and I had to write them down because I didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> but um, in 1982, when I first joined the library staff, I worked half time with Julie at the Springstown branch in JFK as well. Julie was welcoming and she fascinated me. As I observed her work and learned from her, I surmised Julie could probably tap dance if she wanted to, help patrons at the same time, because Julie was just so animated. She seemed to be able to be everywhere at once and was so capable. Her laughter was musical and it was part of who she was. Mm -hmm. Julie's versatility made her somehow magical. She was all-inclusive, fun to be around, an enthusiastic librarian, and a very special human being. Julie was a combination of humor and knowledge and kindness. She made the world such a better place just by being Julie. It was a brand new day and always a good day to go to work and be in the presence of Julie Stratton. Julie was not traditional. God broke the mold when he made Julie. <laughs> so her library was a bit non-traditional, too, in several ways. First of all, <coughs> it shared a roof with a fire station. So aside from having firemen for patrons, we also had another unique regular, a dog named Woody. And Julie kept toys. For, in a special box for Woody. That's the <laughs> Everyone was welcome. I always thought that Julie's Firehouse Library would have made a delightful children's book because it would be filled with the joy and love and a Mary Poppins type of magic, enticing a child to explore the world of books with Julie as the main character. Julie Stratton brought love, friendship, and fun along with the books she shared and dispersed. She saw her patrons with her heart, not just her eyes. She saw them in an avatar kind of way. And she genuinely cared about her staff and community, which made Springstown Library a very comfortable, welcoming environment to not only work in, but to visit. She was also wise. One could learn things not found in books by being with Julie and simply observing her. She was a message walking by simply being who she was as an example. Julie's library also had library kits she served as a role model. These kids came to the library almost daily. I remember one in particular Julie was almost a surrogate mom, too. I used to joke around and say, it's terrible, but she all but wet nursed that kid. <laughs> and she did. I had the pleasure of working with one of her devoted library kids. She had nurtured in his early years at another branch one summer. It was obvious Julie had been a tremendous influence in his life as a young adult. The Springstown Firehouse Library will always have some of Julie Stratton within its walls. She will always and forever be a library legend to me. One super wonderful, awesome thing about Julie, to me as a cat lady was, as you all know by this time, is that Julie was a cat lady, and I'm a cat lady also. And she was a devoted cat mom, feeding a community of felines on the home front. We enjoyed sharing our mutual enthusiasm in cat clips on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Now, when I feed the ferals and their kittens since Julie's passing, I have canonized Julie as her special angel and patron saint. I think Julie would be pleased. We could use a little help from a heavenly presence 
with all the newborn kittens out in the field. And by the way, if you need to adopt a cat, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> this is to Julie. Julie, you gave a spoonful of love and hope, which was good medicine to one and all. You gave it to both humanity you encountered as a library employee and a friend, and compassionately, you extended this gift to the animal kingdom as well. You left this world a better place. Julie, you touched so many lives with the light of what our now famous librarian of the year, Michael Freitz, might call library love or library joy. You were the original version. How fortunate the city of Vallejo and Solano County Library was to have your inspirational presence embracing the lives of your community and its people with the joy of books in your own unique corner of the world. There are so few of us original folks left from the library because it seems like we'd all be around forever. I'm sure a host of those who knew and loved you welcomed you home, and perhaps even Woody the dog and a host of cats. I'd like to think so. Let the words, I'd like to think so, be the last words of a nostalgic chapter in the life and times of Solano County Library called Julie Stratton. It was one of the best. I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> to all those who love Julie, myself included, I'm so sorry for our loss, but we can still carry some of the light of who Julie was and honor her by endeavoring to make the world a better place, making the best of things, and being kind. Thank you. knowing Julie for 61 years. I first met her in 1963 at the Springstown Branch Library, where I walked by every day from Springstown up Oakwood, carrying a load of books uh, that I would um, either renew or pay my exorbitant fines about, because they were always open to. And so that's where Julie was. This is the Julie I first remember, except you have to remember she was wearing a black turtleneck, a black skirt, and her hair came down to here. Now, she was a picture to me of a wider world that I hadn't been in in Vallejo. Um, she was cultured and um, exuberant and a Francophile and beyond what I knew. And, and she, that was my first glimpse of a wider world. Um, I think she pointed me in the direction of the science fiction section of the library, and that was a lifelong love as well. So our entire time together in those 60 years has been an overlapping of books. Um, I first knew her in the library. I then knew her um, later on in um, the late 60s when my college boyfriend was John Bowen's best friend, John Heisch. One day he said, I know this really cool woman. She's got a place in Sandy Beach. You've got to go visit her. So we went down there. Of course I knew Julie. I, I'd known her from the main branch as well. And what I saw was that she was living a life worth living and that she had this crazy dog, um, a black Afghan hound whose nickname was Akmak. Uh, named after the Armenian uh, crackers. And, uh, Akmak was just as eccentric as Julie, I think. And so that was a, a, a real pleasure. So time went on, time went on. And then uh, our lives were always bookish and overlapping. I next knew her when um, years, 20 years had probably gone by, and I had gotten very involved with the Book Club of California, which owes a great deal to Dr. McKeon. Um, I came to the McCune to see how it was doing, and there was Julie. Our friendship revived almost 
instantaneously, and it, it continued on for the next 20 years. She also became good friends with my parents as well. And what I saw in Julie now and today is that she had so many circles, they were overlapping, and she was the center of many different circles, but here we are. Separation anxiety, as she said once to me when we were losing our friend uh, Ju Judith uh, Hilberg. The separation anxiety happens when we're this age, as we lose people. But getting together like this and embracing everything that Julie was and all the circles that she was in makes the world bigger and smaller at the same time. And I hope you'll all enjoy the um, bookmark that we passed out and take some more if you will. But there's, as Julie said, libraries are lands a fantasy and imagination. A library card is a lasting reminder of the power of literacy. And so that's what I think she'd like you to remember. Thanks, Kathleen. Kathleen is uh, responsible for ah, nice. this bookmark, so I hope you all get it. Anithia, would you like to come up? For I think so. Is yes. this okay? Yes. Uh, my name's Alethea Morgan, and I'm associated with the McCune Foundation. But before that, I know Julie from the McCune Committee for many years. And um, I didn't know Julie until later in life. Um, I just moved from Southern California. Uh, and was traveling and stopped by accident to visit a friend in Blair. And somehow, by the end of the week, I had rented an apartment, obtained a library card, only because I accompanied my friend to the library to return books, and I went to a McCune lecture. And somehow, two days after that, I was on the McCune committee. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing what can happen to you when you're on an adventure. Anyway, I met Julie. Uh, she organized the lectures and light refreshments, but I realized there was more to it. The McCune room was a mini version of what she'd had uh, as a much larger venue as a librarian. Here, she was surrounded by books, which is one of her passions, also writers and poets, the written word. And the McCune was her office, I realized, one afternoon. Doing do docent duty, I found a stash of chocolate, the good stuff, like miniature Hershey's and peppermint patties, etc. A higher caliber brand brand-wise than the cookies and crackers she got for the lectures. <laughs> Committee members complained they were too low rent, these uh, cookies. They wanted Trader Joe's. Julie never caved. <laughs> Although the snacks did improve slowly, sometimes. Uh, Julie liked to decorate. She liked to celebrate. Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, etc. Most of us did, and several of us joined in and helped her as she was starting to get really elaborate. And I realized um, Julie liked shopping. <laughs> After a while, it looked like she was trying to clean out the 99 cent store. Pretty soon, there wasn't any space in the cupboards under the books, like around at the back. And um, it wasn't just tablecloths for the tea and coffee. There were Easter bunnies, and baskets, and faux autumn garlands of the yin-yang, plus swaths of materials. We privately figured she must have had an addiction to Joanne's material shop. 
no one knew, no one knew where she got the stuff from, and Judy wasn't telling. And then the cushions started appearing in increasing numbers until there were two on every chair, one to sit on and one for your back. People started tossing them off so they had a space to sit down, actually sit on the chair. We didn't know where she was getting them. They were definitely not Ikea, more like, it was rumored, garage sale. <laughs> but the cushions kept coming until there was a big pile of them over there somewhere. And uh, it looked like a Turkish harem with this pile. <laughs> or harken back to those hippie days of the 60s with cushions on the floor. And then I, it was then I, I realized Julie was transforming her office into her living room. <laughs> and then one day I was on dose and duty, and, Julie, and I told Julie I was going to Paris the next day. And she told me a story when, about when she was young. And I noticed that there's a mention of it in the obituary, but let me tell you what Julie told me. Um, so, must have been 61, 62, yeah. she was 19, and I surmised it was a, a graduation present. Her grandmother took her to Europe on one of those coach tours, popular at the time, a few days in each capital city, so you got a glimpse of what it was like out there. A very popular with Americans. Uh, in fact, they even made a movie about it. If it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium. That's what Julie likened it to. Anyway, when they were in Paris, Julie wanted more than a glimpse. She went to the American Embassy, and you could do that in those days. You could go into your embassy or the American Express. If you were traveling, you could pick up, get your mail, by the end of uh, the 60s, of course, things had changed and you couldn't get near the embassy. Anyway, she found a notice on their notice board. A young American couple living on the outskirts of Paris were offering a room to rent in their, in in their apartment mm -hmm. to an American student. Julie begged to stay, she told me. Begged and begged. Mm -hmm. And she did. Grandma finished the grand tour without her I guess Julie loved being in Paris, but after two months, her father wrote her a note and said, you have to come home. We can't afford to keep you there any longer. So Julie came home. But those kind of experiences when you're young never leave you. So when in Paris, when I was in Paris, I got Julie a couple of souvenirs, an Eiffel Tower key ring for her McCune room keys, and French calendar to hang by her desk. Then when I was in Shakespeare and Company buying some books, I bought her a J.D. Salinger book because books were Julie's life, working life. She was surrounded by them and because you can travel anywhere in the world when you read a book, learn about any place, any culture, any people, any history. You can travel through time and space, wherever you want to, whenever you want to, if you can't actually physically be there. Julie knew that. So, bon voyage, Julie. Godspeed. It was lovely knowing you. Jeff, do you want to come up? Jeff interviewed Julie and has, uh, from conversations with Julie Stratton, a Vallejo library worker, and uh, you can get copies of it from him, and I'll let you tell the story. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here with everyone celebrating Julie. Um, I imagine myself just talking off the top of my head, but I'm no good at that, so I will read off the page. So I ret retired from JFK Library a few years back after 16 years here. 
During that time, I got to know Julie as a frequent visitor to the library and as someone who preceded me as a library worker. And over time, my wife Katie and I got to know her quite well. Sometimes, as I worked at the reference desk, patrons would tell me how much they appreciated the library. One particular man, perhaps in his 30s, who expressed these kind of sentiments, said that he grew up in Vallejo and was often at Springstown Library as a kid. He asked me, do you know Julie Stratton? I said, sure. He said, she had a big influence on me as a kid. She helped shape my childhood. Well, I was so struck by this. I mean, you often hear people saying this kind of thing about an influential adult from childhood. And who are they talking about? Teachers and coaches, not usually a library worker. So this says a lot about who Julie was and how engaged she was with her community and the individuals in it. So in late 2020, I was tasked with organizing many boxes of Vallejo Library archives, mostly documents and old photos, including many snapshots and slides of library events over the years, children's programming, etc. I decided to invite Julie to go through some of it with me and to talk to me about her experiences over her 43-year career. I created a document. Parts of it are my accounts of my conversations with Julie, and parts are from rem reminiscences Julie herself wrote up for me. The piece she emailed me was entitled, A Life in the Day of, A History of Nonconformity. <laughs> and there's a lot of important historical information about how the library operated and its evolution over the many years she worked there. So it was a pleasure working with Julie to get this important inf information documented. So I'd like to read some of the passages. So she starts out by talking about being hired at age 16, and there weren't many jobs. Um, for teens back then, they weren't the kind of fast food um, jobs. And so um, she went back and forth in those early days between the old Carnegie Library and Springstown. And here's an interesting story Julie told me that in the early 70s, when women's lib was going strong, there were some female librarians coming to work at Solano County Library who had a reactionary frame of mind, rabble rousers. They caused problems for administration. Julie gave me these librarians' names and spelled them for me. She remembered these women. Uh, coming mostly from Contra Costa and Oakland, they were provocateurs and agitators who had been involved in recent strikes. The issues were wages and non-exclusivity. They wanted paraprofessionals to have more recognition and responsibility. They were trying to change the culture in Vallejo, which was perceived as cut off from the cultural changes of the day and behind the times, a place where librarians were seen as little old ladies. <laughs> so um, Springstown Library had its financial challenges back then. In order to consolidate and cut costs, the director planned to close Springstown permanently and reassign staff to JFK, leaving East Vallejo without any library services. And so quoting Julie, the community rallied to keep the little library open, with school children massing behind then Mayor Florence Douglas at a city council meeting, holding a banner saying, save our library. Unfortunately for the library director, the city council declined to approve closure of the branch. Cuts in funding had to be made someplace else, or she proposed city library services could merge with the county. Springstown staff were actively involved with protests, pointing out that the libraries that the library serves 11 schools in the area in addition to being the least expensive, most cost-effective branch in the system. Encouraging locals to fight the closure was verboten, of course. So began a lengthy, chilly, stepchildren relationship with the powers that be. Springstown dropped to the bottom of admin's agenda and staff were systematically marginalized and punished for not cooperating. Mm -hmm. Marilyn Pye and Peggy Yost and I were responsible for day-to-day -day operations at that point along with two student departmental aides with little or no support from headquarters. The building's roof had deteriorated so badly that rain poured in during storms, and at one point we were reduced to holding an umbrella over the checkout computer while Torrance sluiced down. So Julie goes on, I managed to get involved with in numerous Soto Voce skirmishes and power struggles with administration over the years. Passive resistance, my specialty. <laughs> My tenet was, if I don't hear from you otherwise, I'll presume you approve. <laughs> However, in 1995, after 27 years at Springstown, I was sent to JFK, which caused a huge outcry from faithful Springstown patrons, angry protests, letters, etc., to the library director. 
Under the aegis of management, the rebellion was crushed, or so they thought, thanks to a couple of influential allies on the Board of Supervisors and County Attorney's Office in Fairfield. I continued in my favorite role as Chief Burr under, the sa under their saddles during my tenure at JFK. So I started to get the impression that Julie Stratton was a woman who didn't take crap from anybody. <laughs> and you, you might not know that about her, you know, just seeing her, she didn't, didn't exactly walk around with a, a swagger of attitude. Um, so, and I want to add that um, on the occasion of her retirement in 2004, there was a lovely full-length article with a big picture of Julie at the top front page of the Billiard Times Herald, which you can see over there. Um, yes, good that you have that over there. Um, so in looking over that article with Julie, I could tell how happy it made her. It really showed how the whole community loved her. So I'll close with this uh, reminiscence uh, of Springstown in Julie's words. <coughs> I did all the story times and class visits. Peggy and or Marilyn checked out books while sorting daily deliveries, answering the phone, reference questions, etc. We scheduled performers for summer programs and managed to squeeze everyone inside, packed cheek to jowl. Children's services and programming were not generally a system-wide priority, so we had to come up with our own ideas. Everyone pretty much did their own services and programming. We're not generally a, not, not generally a system-wide priority, so we had to come up with our own ideas. Everyone pretty much did their own thing, pre-standardizing of publicity and programs. I instituted our annual summer pet show and parade. And this is standard these days, you know, it's just every year, so it started with Julie. We had a great time thinking up prize-winning categories, and everyone, of course, got a prize. We walked the kids to the rest home on the other side of the library, much to the delight of the senior residents. Parents were involved in activities, too. We had a reptile show coordinated by one of the dads, and another dad volunteered one year as Santa. Springstown was also a haven for latchkey kids after school. We provided snacks as necessary, and upon occasion, we would give kids a ride home when we closed after dark. Local animal residents included Josephine, a long-haired kitty, who actually lived at the rest home and cheerfully occupied any lap available. Also Witty, a Weimariner of sorts, and Chief, the charming pug. One or the other would be waiting on the front porch when we opened on those long-ago summer days. Thank you. Don, so I'm going to read a letter from Joanne Shively, now, who couldn't be here today, but she wanted to send us in. I keep looking around just in case she did sneak in here. Uh, Joanne is in her early 90s and still very active and a former city council member. Uh, a lot of you in this room knew her much better, or know her much better than I did, but uh, she was a longtime friend of Julie's. She said, working with Julie on the McCune Commission was a pleasure. Working with her on events of the McCune Room was a lot more fun. When the McCune's first steward, Judith Hilbert, passed away, Julie stepped in and saved the collection for a city deeply distracted by other issues. She was devoted to books and sort of made the McCune Room her second home. She was a supporter of arts and culture and did her best to keep them alive in Vallejo. On the commission, she tried to be fair to everyone, always attempting to see all sides of a controversy. I guess we have many of those here. Um, for many years, she really excelled at organizing the semi-annual speaker series, which introduced many Vallejo res residents to the McCune Room and collection. She helped keep the room open for visitors. She performed many of the routine office tasks. She collaborated with McCune Foundation on fundraising, as a personal friend, she was a thoughtful and caring friend, calling me on birthdays, and when I was not well, I, always, I already miss our lunches, our chats. Whatever world you are in now, Julie, I hope it's as beautiful as the world you tried to make here. Thanks, Don. Now we'd like to bring up Brenda from Field and yeah, Angie Taylor, after that, 
to talk about the Julie Civic involvement. What a well and wonderful, long-awaited day. My name is Brenda Brumfield, and giving honor to God and the Honorable Mayor Robert McConnell, I just want to let you know, and the rest of the community here, if you're here, you're here because you loved Julie. And she was, she was someone to reckon with. I loved her very much. I was a the last person on this across there in terms of uh, beloved life, companion, sister, cousin, auntie, and friend. Mm -hmm. She was a dear friend of mine. I want you to know that. And the way we, we became friends was through D.G. Christian. And D.G. Christian uh, was in Vallejo Sister City Association, which is right next door to here. Mm -hmm. And over many, many years, we had a lot of connections with outside of Vallejo. She and I would go to conferences together and do many things, you know, around the Bay Area, the state of California, uh, many states throughout the United States. <clears throat> And she introduced me to Julie. And I tell you, this was through our involvement with Sister Cities. And Sister Cities, let me give you a little tidbit about it, was started in 1956 by President Dwight D. Eisenhower. And it was started to advance peace and prosperity through cultural, educational, humanitarian, and economic development and exchanges throughout the world. He wanted cities in the United States to connect with cities abroad, cities and countries abroad. And history's going to show you in the near future that President Dwight D. Eisenhower was one of the best presidents we've ever had in modern history. Um, now, rolling forward, when we started here in the city of Vallejo in the early 60s, was about the same time Julie had gone over to Europe. And that connection stayed with her. And so when we started here with sister city relationships, <coughs> she became very interested and I'm sure that played a great role in her relationship, not only here in the McEwen room, but also her relationship with people throughout the community as well as sister city involvement. Now, Vallejo presently has seven sister cities, and I'm just going to tell you those because that will also give you an idea how Julie played into our relationships. We have Trondheim, Trondheim Norway, La Spezia, Italy, we have uh, Akashi, Japan. We have um, Baguio in the Philippines. We have Bagamoyo in Tanzania. And we have um, Chinchong, South Korea. And our last and most recent one, and you're all going to love this because it's almost like saying, oh, why didn't we think of this earlier? We have. Mexico, we have Ensenada, Mexico. So that's like putting tequila and wine together, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's other, under Robert, uh, Mayor Robert McConnell's uh, advice as well as working with sister cities to make that happen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, did I hit it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me move this over a little bit. So, Northern, the Northern California chapters were under the umbrella, and there are at least 80-some cities now throughout Northern California that have watched us grow. Vallejo has become like a poster child, we'll say, okay? And people all over the world know about Vallejo and sister cities. 
And uh, I just want you to know that over the years in working with Julie, Vallejo, California has always been a major player in the advancement of world-renowned organization of Sister Cities International. And some of the players that she knew, knew and assisted in helping us to do this were, of course, I already mentioned D.G. Christian, mm -hmm. but just to name a few, a tidbit, Barbara Candelas, mm -hmm. Robert Sather, Dom Datu, David Lindquist, Mayor Glory Exline, Mayor Tony Intentally, Mayor um, Bob Sampion, and Mayor Robert McConnell, of course. And it's open for bigger and better growth. And I see it happening before my eyes. And you'll see, you hear about it. It's starting to really, really grow. And we, as a city, you're recognized. Even as people come from around the world, come into our you know, region, Northern California, they want to know about California, uh, Vallejo. And so, as, as it relates to Julie, she was introduced, like I said, to me by DG. And um, they both became very dear friends of mine because of the warmth that they exuded and outgoing personalities, love of this community. They, were very, they both were very resourceful and they had the ability to be comical. We all know that. <laughs> and they were able to share without even trying. Uh, we seem to gravitate and to attract, and you know, cats. And yes, I'm a cat lady. And they, were, they were cat ladies. I had just lost my Siamese cat, a Siamese cat, cat that I had had for about seven years. And I was so torn up. People don't know how attached or, you know, gravitated you are to your pets. They're like part of your family. And I would tell somebody, you know, my cat died or whatever. And they look at me, well, so? You know, that's how they kind of do. But when I told Julie, she said, oh, come sit down. <laughs> sit down. And I was just boo-hooing. And she said, oh, she said, you don't, it's going to be OK, Brenda. She, she said, people don't understand. Cats are like companions. I said, I understand. That was my companion. Mm -hmm. And so she went on, and she, she really uh, helped me to get through that over, the, you know, over a few days. She would call me, and I would come in and sit down with her, and we'd have lunch. But I had to work through that. It's like losing a member of your family. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was my cat, Rocca. So anyway, D.G. got ill after a very bad fall and never seemed to be getting better. And eventually her daughter and her daughter's husband moved her to Portland, Oregon on her, after her 90th birthday, which, which she celebrated in my home. Mm -hmm. And um, she died at age 94. Mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to go see her and visit her while she was there in Portland in the care home. Julie and I really missed her tremendously. And I would come to the McEwen room in the library and we would have lunch and reminisce about DG. But that took a while to get through. Julie Steck Stratton became very steeped in the community around local, city, and town issues because of her resourcefulness mm -hmm. and the ability to connect and know so many people in the community. In a way, she was like a caretaker. If you needed to get a specific piece of information about a historical uh, event or data, she was able to retrieve that information and could also add the information that she felt would be good based on her experience or her interpretation. So Julie was a human AI before the technological AI was developed, okay? Amen. <laughs> Julie was so helpful for our local sister cities in sharing not only information and giving us space. We could come over and sometimes we would have events that we would come into this room. And just like we're having here, 
if it got too big, we would come over here and she would support sister cities. And the space and the branch, we branched out. In fact, when we started having the Mighty Continent, which is the uh, activity that I would coordinate, we would, we would have to, you know, look for spaces and couldn't find them. And so Julie said, look, that space over there across where the children's library used to be is empty. She said, well, let's clean it up and you can have it here and have it there. I said, really, Judy? She said, yeah. And you know what? We did. <laughs> and we had so many people from the community to come in. We had the arts. We had authors, like you say, you know, that would come in. And it was just the best thing that could have ever happened. And guess what? The city saw us doing that and they said, oh, we can expand, you know, we got to fix up the, you know, city council over next door. We got to get that together. So when we close that down, let's go over to that space next door. And oh, it became so nice. We get to see people coming and going and whatever, you know, in terms of, and, and Julie felt really good about that. So uh, just like you said, she was very connected. People knew her. They respected her for holding this space down. And um, just to let you know one more tidbit, Julie loved our local community and surrounding areas, not just the city of Vallejo, but also up in Fairfield. She was known, you know, because of the county of Solano and the Library Association, what have you. But she liked attending and going to fairs, activities such as the Peace of Sinaian, Juneteenth, the Friday Walks in downtown. Mm -hmm. um, and she loved going to one, one major event uh, that had crab feed. And it was Theta Pi chapter of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity. <laughs> and Gracie and Ed Wooder, and Gracie's here, raise your hand. Gracie used to work with Julie, there she is. She worked with her over there in the Springstown Library. And um, she uh, was like part of their family. They would invite her to that crab feed along with their daughter and her husband, Adam, who's also sitting right there next to Gracie. <laughs> and so this was one of the best events that Julie loved. She loved going to that crab feed because they had all kind of other things, spaghetti, salads, what you name it, and she had, you know, fun seeing a lot of people. This is when she extended over into the cultural parts of the city of Vallejo. There will never be another person like Julie Stratton, and I just want to attempt to sum up her friendship to me through her name, Julie. J for just. She was a very just person as far as I'm concerned. She all, was always just a fair person in her ability to share. She was you, unconditional, with giving, caring, and patience. L, love to be included in the goodness of our community. Uh, I, and she was very intelligent, Extreme. intelligently, internationally and well versed and knowledgeable. Anybody like a person like that, she could get a job in any AI firm if she was still here right now, even at her age. Okay, E for Julie, very empowering. Her words were powerful, almost like when E.F. Hudson speaks, <laughs> okay, what do you do? Okay. And I leave you with this quote from a writing by Edwin Markham. And it's uh, titled, Others. There is a destiny that makes us brothers, and I also put sisters by that. None goes his or her way alone. All that we send into the lives of others come back. It comes back <coughs> into our own. I've learned so much from Julie. And when she was, when she was uh, 
on Facebook, it got into a little bit of discrepancy with, you know, a few little groups in the community. Uh, oh. I called her and we talked. And I said, Julie, you learn, you live by your mistakes and you learn, but just know this. I will never leave you or forsake you. And I love you. And to God be the glory. Thank you all for coming and thank you for the organization of this wonderful event. Uh, many of you saw an aspect of Julie's life today that maybe you didn't realize before and it filled in some of the gaps because we get to know people at different times in their, their lives. I got to know her both socially and politically, probably more politically than anything else. Socially, she, we, we would see her out in the city often and engage her in conversation. She also sought my professional advice begin with, it was just a traditional relationship, but then as, as the conversations shifted more into the municipal concerns, she would come in, sit down in a rather large chair on a, across from a very large desk, and I would have to ask her, well, are you here to speak to me from that chair, or do we have to go down to the war room and talk? <laughs> war room is where we hatch all these miserable plots. And she was a very active embodiment in that. There's one thing on this card that is not, that is missing, and that is civic activist. She was truly a civic activist. And I think because of her activities in France, where she picked up such a love of the language and of their way of government, and when she returned to Vallejo and said, it's kind of boring. <laughs> she decided to do something about it. She brought interest to Vallejo, and she spread that interest throughout the community as she encountered people from time to time to time and became even more involved. I, of course, met with her and conferred with her many times on, you name it, street designs, general plan, and indeed an awful lot about Sandy Beach, even though she is not a part of the city, she saw community as more than just the city or Sandy Beach or the county. She saw us as a group of people with common interests who needed to come together. And she would do her research, she'd point out things, geez, did you think about this? Sometimes no, <laughs> sometimes yes. But it always led to a very introspective discussion and that was her, her power. And we all know that they're friends of the library. Julie was not just a friend of the library. She was a warrior for the library, and she was a warrior especially for the McEwen room. And this room and this collection always continues to stand in danger of being taken because of the needs of the greater city. So those of you who wish to emulate her lessons, become a warrior for the McEwen room. Become a warrior for the library, because if you don't, it's always on the first block of chopping. And Julie never believed in giving up. She fought for what she supported, what she wanted to say. She would continue to say it in different ways, but always with that loving and enduring smile that will never leave us in our memories. So thank you so much for organizing this. And Julie, I know we're all going to miss you so very, very much. Keep up the fight. So much I'm learning about my sister today too that I didn't know. Thank you, Mayor McConnell. Uh, so we've heard library experiences and Sandy Beach experiences, and I want to bring up and the civic experiences. But I want to have one more cast up 
uh, Dave Anderson, and uh, and then my brother Bill will close. And uh, Dave's main, uh, well, you want to talk about it? This is the Monterey Jazz Festival guy, as you can see on his shirt. Thank you. Shirt's only 23 years old. Come on. <laughs> Um, Miss, Miss Julie was a, a good friend of my, my mother. Uh, they had similar passions, uh, libraries, teaching, jazz music. So um, in the beginning, 1958, uh, my parents attended the second annual Monterey Jazz Festival. Um, they couldn't go to the first because my mother was pregnant with one of my sisters. Um, but the Monterey Jazz Festival is a three-day party of music, food, food and friends. Uh, it's the oldest continuous running jazz festival in the United States. This next weekend, I'm, I believe, will be their 60, 67th year. Um, as Bob and Dad spread the word to friends, they would want to attend. So the party grew to around 250 people. At one point, my mother was the cruise director. <laughs> Everybody would simply send her their money. She would arrange rooms, transportation, tickets to the festival, the whole nine yards. Um, she would um, make sure that the uh, attendees were well taken care of. Um, I remember one particular hotel, um, they actually added in enough extra money to the, to the room tickets so that they had one free room it was just considered the party room. And they would buy booze and put it in there and the party room was open when the, when the festival wasn't going on. So there was always something happening. Um, part of the group would charter a bus from Los Angeles, party all the way up. While the bus was in Monterey, it was the transportation to and from the sets. And um, so they, they uh, made use of <laughs> whatever they could. Uh, as the group dwindled down in size, my mother uh, gave responsibility to season ticket holders for their own arrangements, and I was given the seats that, that Jimmy and Julie bought for many years. Um, Jimmy was a, was a member of the group for um, a few years before um, getting together with, again with Julie, and uh, that's how that whole, that whole thing hooked up. I think, I think Jim had to talk her into it, but... She finally came up and uh, she would sit there in her seat and she'd always have um, her sketch pad. Always. Was, if she carried it everywhere. It was just a sketch. I never had the pleasure of seeing anything that she sketched, but she always had that pad. I always remember her just running around with the pad. Um, she was quite funny, but you had to really pay attention to pick up on her insights. Uh, Miss Julie is now enjoying the Big Jazz Festival in the Sky with Jimmy and my parents and all the great jazz musicians <coughs> that have gone on. Thank you. Thanks. We have so many great memories from the Monterey Jazz Festival. And my brother Bill. <laughs> we got about eight pages here. But yeah. <laughs> He's going to be speaking on some artwork over there. Yeah, not much. If you came for a lecture on art, you might be right. But I will say that um, the kitchen cabinets were, when when she moved into, when they moved into uh, Sandy Beach, it was, it was kind of like a, a, a shack. <laughs> well, let's say it was a shack. <laughs> and, uh, they got these uh, cabinets from Sears. You know, to get these unfinished cabinets, right? And she um, decided that was what she wanted. So, a little whatever. bit louder, please. Mike, I think I'm going to the mic. Hi. Sorry. Anyway, um, this was done in the 60s, and some of you may recall that uh, the 60s was a kind of a busy decade. <laughs> So that's pretty much what, what you see there. Uh, what else did I do? Let's say. I wrote, her art was informed of this flood of ideas and change. 
it's sort there's sort of I, I think a kind of a where's Waldo thing going on here with uh, at the time institutions were being under you know, attack and so forth. You can see her sense of political humor and the, the fact that she's a, like a gadfly. So that's that's about all. I mean, I'm you know you could just check it out. It's like like I said, where's Waldo. And I wanted to talk about my sister instead of them. So. She's my older sister. She loved playing tricks and was a trickster to my gullible, kind of faithful sidekick, tag along younger brother. She was the Igor to, I was the Igor to her, Dr. Frankenstein, and Charlie Brown to Lucy. Pancho to Cisco, that kind of, that kind of relationship. And uh, uh, I can remember, I think the first thing I remember was when I was like two, she, we were doing, um, we were picking uh, almonds off the ground in Chico, and she was like, going to show me how to get the right almonds that they were the easier to open. I remember in Halloween, we were living in Richmond in, in uh, post-war housing. And along with my cousin Bruce and Julie and I, we, we trick-or-treated this amazing treat pile of candy. It was about as tall as me. Mm -hmm. Several times when we visited Yosemite, we took turns yelling, Elmer, into the trees and rafted down the Merced River on air mattresses. I remember her using Mad Magazine to help me learn how to read. <laughs> Finally got me out of the yellow birds. Uh, it, was her, I wrote this. it was her voice I heard when we skipped about a million stair steps down the beach at Aptos to the cement ship, looking for seashells and those kelp poppet things. I imagine we might just walk all the way down to Capitola and see that part. Somewhere before my high school graduation, Julie joined me for a week while I was picking tomatoes at Dixon. She wanted to see what the work was like, she did, and what the people were like. College, I remember, hikes to the back country. I'd get ahead of her, then hunk her down the side of the trail, waiting for her to catch up. In time, she would appear, stop, probably stop to write a sketch or something. Always, always went, you know, to the her own drummer kind of thing. She didn't, didn't stop her other stuff. I remember our campsite at Washburn Lake talking deep, deep into the night as the wood smoke curled up to trees with the stars and our campfire flames and finally got her head out. It's too hard to go, you know, back to bed. There were mornings at Boyle Junior College having a cup of tea before class or sharing poems or the campers uh, literary pub that uh, she helped put together with Brendan Riley and a couple other people in our care. That was the second edition of it. My sister was a, a letter writer mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in pre-computer days. She made her own stationery by, she'd find a picture and Xerox it. You get this kind of a shiny paper and then she'd write me a letter on the back, mm -hmm. or kind of scribble down the sides. Usually the picture had something to do with, with what was going on with you and her. You know, uh, I, I wrote, for writing, for Julie writing a letter was a deliberate affair. Each, was, each word is carefully weighed and reweighed. Letters you keep, and I have kept them all. And I reread them many times. When I was stationed far away, Julie wrote to me. She wrote to cheer me up to remind me that I <clears throat> wasn't so alone. Her letters took me to the high country, writing so vividly I could imagine the trail she took. I remember that. And the smell of the manzanita or the sound of a blue jay scalding us. She had a generous, self-deprecating sense of humor. It was quick to pierce the artificial and pretentious and often amused by her own foibles, she um, say, I scoffed, by, uh, hoist by my own petard, that's a big one. 
I remember when she first moved to Sandy Beach in 1964. She didn't have a lot of money for furniture. So she got some scraps at the, um, they had these polyester batting scraps at um, Sierra Designs in Berkeley, in back room there. So she'd go out and help file a uh, bunch of those things, and she'd go to the Cost Plus, or no, it was in, um, the Cost Plus, I guess. She'd buy these uh, bedspreads, Paisley bedspreads, kind of the Indian print stuff. And uh, we wouldn't imagine this, and she would use those to make these big floor pillows for her place, and you could sit on them. So, and she liked to decorate her home with these odd, odd stuff, like uh, having a bunch of dinosaurs at a, at a um, manger, Christmas manger. <laughs> so you'd get this, you know, she would, there would be a pun to it, and a little bit of interest in it. So she liked to do, she liked to do, um, pose things that were unusual with other things, and, or vice versa. She really was thrifty in the family, and she, she was uh, really into, intolerant of, of wasting things. At the grocery store, she, she would fill up an egg carton with cracked eggs. And uh, I think part of it was because, she, and she wanted to save a buck, but part of it was um, she hated the idea of just throwing the stuff out, and she'd say, it's perfectly good, you know, <laughs> came through the doorway. She found ways to recycle everything. I still hear, I, you know, she said so often to me, we live so well. And, and so there was like, a, it, it took so little effort to recycle and do that kind of stuff. Um, and I want to close with a story that I've often told about my sister. It was a summer morning, one morning, and I was dropping her off to work uh, here. And uh, it was one of those summer mornings where it's, you have lots to do on the ground, and uh, you could see the steam coming up off the side <coughs> as, as the morning warmed up. And so we were running, where are right there? Yeah, you could see the steam. We were running late, so when I pulled up to the curb, she grabbed her stuff and took, you know, she was hurrying off to work. And so as she scurried down the walk, suddenly she stopped and she bent over and flicked the worm off of the sidewalk into the grass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a little further on, another worm. Yeah. <laughs> and another, and another. And it seemed to me that she was like greeting each little life that she met on her way to work. And that's, that's my sister. And I'd like to close by thanking my brother and his, his wife, Regina. Uh, this wouldn't have happened without that, without my brother doing this. He's playing. So that's all I have to say. So, <clears throat> I know I, I, I may mention of an open mic, but we've been sitting quite a while. Uh, can I see a show of hands who did want to share? Um, what I'd like to do is, um, I'm going to run the slideshow. We can go break for the bathroom and some food and come back in, and we'll have uh, the open mic at that point. And, uh, Actually, we're almost out of here too, but I don't want to limit too much, but we do have a time limit. So anyway, thank you so much. Let me just say, uh, on the slideshow that I put together, um, oop, hold on, I need to read it. I've got, a, uh, in the slideshow, there's a number of fair, uh, uh, photos from various sources. And as probably many of you know, Julie loved doing the rabbit ears behind your head, so you'll, you'll see You'll see that quite often as I run the thing. Um, and I'm grateful uh, for Julie's playful spirit. And I know we're all grateful for the time we shared with her while she was on this earth. I'd also like to say thanks for everyone who shared their memories. Uh, she was a unique and delightful person, as we've heard. Uh, she'll be missed greatly. 
And uh, I want to thank uh, Wayne Goodman for playing piano at the beginning. Thank you very much for your beautiful music. And uh, my sister and sisters-in-law for uh, contributing, uh, doing work with the flowers, and uh, several other things. And thank you to all of our extended family who are here to help get this set up as well. Um, and let's gather out the lobby and back in here. And we'll, we will have the mic for a little bit longer for those of you who would like to speak. But I want to allow some time to get up and, and stretch a little bit. And uh, if you want to speak, come up and, and let me know.